Good morning, and welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. This is our creed. Seattle Atheist Church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. Um, so before we get started, there's just a couple pieces of housekeeping. We have a lot of events coming up now. There have become formalized events on the calendar. Check the calendar if you're interested in movie nights, board games, playing pool, and other things we do in addition to meeting here on Sundays. Uh, the other thing I want to um, remind everyone is somewhere, I guess over there by the door, there is the um, place to drop money. You want to support the church financially. And you can also do that by going online to clatheist.church. There's a donate button. And some people have it set up that they donate off of Meetup. So um, we appreciate that. That's why we pay for the room, basically. Uh, and finally, the way that we do our talks is we, ha the members ourselves give the talks. So um, super looking forward to your talk, Eva. Please come on up. Uh, I think Wednesday you had Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot. And Wednesday had, I'm so sorry, Wednesday, come on up, come on up. Wednesday had a special <laughs> announcement as well. Before we get started, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. So, hi, I'm Wednesday. I use she and her pronouns. I just wanted to take a minute after the announcements before we get into the talk because I was talking to some members of the YMCA who were out spreading awareness about a program they're doing. Um, they were talking downtown. Basically, they've got a new program working to end youth homelessness in Seattle, working on providing transitional housing, job training, food resources, etc. Um, and they do transitional housing for up to, I think, age 25 is considered youth by their standards. Um, and there's a bunch of ways that you can assist if you're interested, but even just getting the word out if you have any youth friends in Seattle or a wider network that might find it valuable. And they're calling it the Accelerator YMCA program. Um, so I just wanted to mention that in case anyone has a way to spread that awareness and make sure people know about that resource. Thanks, you guys. Good morning, or afternoon. Um, I'm Eva. And I'm talking today about the work of John Gottman. Um, I'm going to start off by saying something that is pretty obvious to anyone who's read any relationship advice books. They mostly suck. <laughs> <laughs> um, in general, books on how to save your marriage or have a better relationship or whatever are pretty much made up. Um, people write books based on their prejudices, how they were raised, stuff that seems like it would work, stuff that works for them in their marriage, um, stuff that worked for their first marriage, turns out doesn't work for the second one, uh, John Gray. <laughs> um, so there's not a whole lot out there that's actually science-based. And John Gottman is a hugely outlying exception to this rule. Um, he is globally acknowledged as a leader in the science of relationships. He's written over 40 books. Um, he does workshops and also couples therapy, but primarily he's spreading his information to a wider audience, so books and workshops. Um, so um, he, uh, he's an emeritus professor of psychology at the UW right here, um, and his research base there is called the Love Lab. Um, he's been working on this topic for 20 years, um, I think over 20 years at this point. Um, so what he started off doing was observing couples. And he would have them talk and interact, and he would watch them. And he would take audio and video recordings, and also wire them up to like heart rate monitors, um, electrical conductivity monitors, like a polygraph, so he's measuring stress levels, 
Um, measure cortisol levels. It's also a measure of stress before and after a conversation. Um, and he did uh, surveys with them about their marital satisfaction. Um, and he also did follow-up studies about who ended up divorcing, who ended up staying together. Um, so at first, he was just doing this observation to find out how people are interacting and how that correlates with whether they stick together, whether they have a happy relationship. And well, let's go over some of the things people think make relationships work or don't make relationships work. What makes a relationship work? What makes a marriage last? Being in love? Lots and lots of love? Yeah, maybe not so much. Um, you can love each other a lot and still communicate really badly, still end up having some really bad habits that break yourselves apart. So regardless of what the movie uh, wisdom out there is, that's not gonna give you the skills on the compatibility. Oh, compatibility. Well, if you just have common interests and you get along well, that should make your marriage last, right? Well, some kinds of compatibility don't match up with other kinds, and if you're not compatible, what do you do? Just give up? Um, commitment. If you're just committed enough, it'll work. Well, you could be really, really committed, but how do you apply that? It's like, I am gonna stay married. How do I do this? That doesn't actually give you any information. Um, there are some ideas of what makes marriage work that have come up more recently, um, that have come from therapeutic movements, like speak in I statements. Well, that can be a useful tool, but even I statements, like, even I statements can be abused and they're not gonna solve all your problems. It is possible to say something like, I feel that I'm being very put upon and I shouldn't have to put up with this. From well, someone like you. From someone like you, yeah. <laughs> um, so limited applicability. Um, Reciprocity, okay, this is sounding good. There should be some give and take in a relationship. Um, people should all be able to uh, get what they need and so on. The problem with the concept of reciprocity as kind of a core of what makes it work is people get into uh, keeping score and going, well, I'm not gonna because she hasn't, or she better do this, um, I don't owe him that, and that's not a healthy, state to come from a relationship, come at a relationship from. Um, how about having deep conversations where you share your personal vulnerabilities? Now that, that can also, that can be really useful, but that's also only gonna take you so far. Um, most marriages actually don't do a whole lot of that. And people can have very happy, very long-lasting marriages where mostly they don't talk about that kind of thing. And that's fine. You can also have marriages where people constantly talk about the stuff that's really important to them and that they feel hurt and they keep on feeling hurt. Um, so again, it doesn't get to the core of what does it. What do people think kills marriages? Fighting, right? Fighting's terrible. Well, actually, it turns out there are a whole lot of happy marriages where people fight a lot, but they make up and it's fine and they're not terribly stressed by it overall. Okay, so not fighting. I mean, you've got to actually work out your conflicts. Well, actually, it turns out there are a lot of marriages where people don't really ever work out the conflicts, but they have figured out ways to get by anyway. And they go off and they deal with their feelings and they come back and they still love each other and get along. So what the heck? What kills marriages? What sticks them together? Okay, okay. Some things that some things that break up marriages, right? Infidelity, right? That breaks up marriages. Okay, never mind polyamory. Um, it, okay, in a monogamous marriage, though, infidelity. Usually, if people are cheating on their spouse, they're already unhappy. Is the problem? Um, some people are just neurotic, and you can't deal with them. Okay, actually, most people are somewhat neurotic, and most people who are neurotic manage to get along anyway. They manage to work around each other's difficulties. Irreconcilable differences. <laughs> that's, that's why people get divorced.
divorced, right? It's right there in the, the fault divorce thing, the no fault divorce thing, irreconcilable differences. <coughs> mm. A secret that John Gottman found out is that everybody has irreconcilable differences. And one of the deals about marriage is you have to learn how to work around the things you are never going to reconcile. That is always going to drive you crazy about this person. You are always going to want the opposite thing. How do you deal with it anyway? So getting back to what John Gottman did and found out, um, after doing a lot of these studies where he observed couples talking and took all these measurements of them, he's got lab assistants counting eye blinks on the video, counting the times that people look at each other, counting the kinds of things they say, whether they touch each other, all these measures. So he went in going, let's just measure this stuff, to see what correlates to what. And once he had some correlations worked out, he's, he was doing longitudinal studies, he did follow-ups on people to find out whether they split or whether they were happy. Um, and he, uh, he even does studies where couples stay in the lab, which has an apartment in it, for an entire weekend with video cameras on them. Not in the bedroom, not in the bathroom, but everywhere else. Um, and he's gotten to the point where he can actually predict whether a couple will divorce within the next, I think it was five years, mm -hmm. with over 90% accuracy. Next two years. Next two years, was it? Um, with over 90% accuracy from observing them having a few minutes conversation. I, I read in some places it was a three minute conversation, others it was 15, so I don't know. Probably the, ver the uh, accuracy varies a little bit. Um, and he's done a whole bunch of different studies, so it may be from different studies. So he's gone on to develop some interventions that reliably improve these outcomes. So he went from observing to predicting to actually successfully intervening. And this is not applicable just to marriage or just to relationships, uh, uh, just to romantic relationships. It's also applicable to parent-child relationships, to work relationships. Any time you're interacting with humans, and particularly in an ongoing way, these principles apply. Um, some of what I'll say, he, he's, his studies are usually on heterosexual married couples, so some of it will be phrased that way, but it applies to all kinds of relationships. Um, and like I said, he's written over 40 books. Some of them are co-written with his wife, Julie Gottman. Some of them are uh, co-written with other people, but just a huge, arrange, a huge array of books, and most of them are presented to the public. They're very easy to read. They've got lots of exercises and direct applicability to your life. It's not a lot of dry statistics. Um, so what actually kills relationships? Gottman found out there are four things that are harbingers of doom in a relationship. And he calls those the four horsemen. They are criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. So I'm going to go a little bit into what those are, and then I'm going to go on and spend most of my time on what saves marriages. Um, criticism is distinct from complaints. He's actually, he praises complaint, actually, as an approach. A complaint is when you say, I have this problem and I want to solve it. Criticism is when you say, you suck. <laughs> you always, you never, why can't you ever you do this to me, you have this flaw. When you're blanket, when you're saying something bad about someone in a blanket way without saying you're doing the specific thing that I would like to change, that is criticism is distinct from complaint. Um, so when there's, basically everybody does all these things a little bit sometimes. It's pretty hard to eliminate them entirely. But when, so it's always, a, it's always harmful to a relationship for them to be present. But when it's a sign of doom is when the overwhelming impression of the relationship is these things. So if most of your interactions with someone are critical, or actually from other people's work, if there's like uh, more than one in five of your interactions is negative like this, um, it's going to be really bad for your relationship. So that's criticism. Defensiveness. 
someone brings forward a complaint. They say, hey, you know, I would really like it if you do the dishes more often. And defensiveness is like, well, you don't do this other thing. Or, well, I did the dishes yesterday. Or, well, I do lots of other stuff around here, you know. Those things do not, you're not listening to the complaint and you're instead throwing up a defensive wall, not allowing, not listening or responding or allowing the partner to influence you. Um, allowing the partner to influence you is one of the things that does help. Um, defensiveness makes it very hard to work out solutions to problems. And it's hard to give up, it's hard to go, oh, you're saying something that you don't like about what I'm doing. Wait, let me calm down here, let me think about that. I may not think that's fair, but obviously you think it's a problem, so let me think about what this problem is and how we can solve it. Um, then, uh, let's see, contempt. Contempt is probably the biggest, most important bad sign, bad thing in a marriage or another relationship. Um, contempt can be anything from you're just like your father, he was never any good for anything, which is just a, a you know, universal revilement to you know, a little roll of the eyes, a sneer. Those are contempt. They're signaling disgust at the person you're talking to. And that is a rejection of them as a person, and it breaks that connection that you're trying to strengthen. Um, so it's really, really important to try to teach yourself not to display contempt to your loved ones. Um, and the fourth uh, horseman is stonewalling. Stonewalling means stopping responding. You have you're no longer engaged in communication. Someone is talking to you, maybe they're pleading with you to do something or help them or uh, talk to them, and you're just sitting there going like this. Maybe you have your, your nose stuck in your phone and you're going, leave me alone. Maybe you are just straight up ignoring them. Maybe you walk out of the room. A response like that that cuts off communication is cutting off the connection with your loved one. Sometimes people t need to take a break. Um, there's a concept he calls flooding, which is when you're emotionally overwhelmed in a conversation. That can happen if you're getting messages of contempt or criticism, for instance, or if you're feeling anxious or guilty. Any kind of a negative emotion that is just overwhelming will cause flooding. Um, and flooding can lead to stonewalling. It's better if you can say, I'm a little overwhelmed, I need a break, and leave. Then you've communicated, you come back. Um, stonewalling is more common in men. Um, women are more likely to express emotional overwhelmedness by crying or other kinds of emotional outbursts rather than shutdown. Um, whether that's cultural or innate, it's just a, a common pattern that he noticed. Um, so, what does work? Heard about some things that are really destructive to relationships and are also really common and really human. There's a whole, whole lot in Gottman's books and there's no way I could cover all of it or even the most important stuff but I'm going to try to go into a fair amount of depth on what I think is the most core concept in pretty much all of his books, which is making and responding to bids for connection. A bid for connection is any action that attempts to establish or strengthen a bond with another person. It's a request for emotional connection. And it can be anything from a straight up statement, hey, I'd like to spend some time with you this afternoon to a smile, or blowing someone a kiss, or touching them, putting an arm around them, ruffling their hair, just touching their hand. It could be a, a noise. Um, it's kind of a, an acknowledgement of shared emotional relationship um, response. So any kind of a communication, whether it, or, or an action too, handing someone a cup of tea is a bid for connection. 
So any kind of action, motion, utterance, whatever, that is intending to establish or maintain or reestablish an emotional connection with someone is a bid for connection. People who make more bids and respond better to bids have stronger relationships. Um, people who have given up on giving bids because they keep having them responded to poorly are lonely and so are their partners. If you've learned that your bids are going to be rejected, you stop making them and it becomes this downward spiral. You can switch it into being an upward spiral by making more and responding to them better. And even one person in a relationship can shift that balance. It's easier if you're both working on it, but one person can make that shift. Um, there are three ways to respond to a bid. You can turn away, ignore it, say, I'm busy, uh, be quiet, I'm watching the show, um, interrupt them, say something completely irrelevant, um, say something that indicates that you're distracted, not really paying attention to what they said. All of those are turning away. They're ways of not providing your attention or emotional engagement. Um, then there's turning against, uh, uh, turning, turning away from is basically passive rejection. Um, turning against is active rejection, responding with aggression, criticism, sarcasm, um, direct contradiction is not. Um, all, of, all of those are turning against a person's bid. The third way of responding is the one that strengthens connections, and that is turning towards. If you turn towards your partner's bids, most of the time, your relationship will be stronger. Um, turning towards is accepting the bid for connection. It's a way of engaging or joining in with their bid. Their bid is saying, I want connection with you. By turning towards that bid, you're saying, hey, me too. I want a connection with you. It could be asking a question or saying something that shows that you understood what they said or that you seek to understand what they said. You're interested in what they said. You're looking at them, maybe smiling at them or looking sad if they told you something sad. Maybe just making a noise of acknowledgement. Oh, uh -huh. oh yeah. Um, laughing at their joke. Um, maybe making a friendly joke back. Um, helping them in response to what they're asking for or working on. Um, any response that recognizes a common goal, interest, or attribute. Um, Nikki and I noticed last night that in-jokes are, uh, are bids for connection and turning towards. If I say something that's a reference that we share and you respond with the other piece of it, we've just made a connection. Um, I bid, you turn toward. Um, again, just like with bids, a touch or an expression can be uh, turning towards as well. If Mickey leans over to kiss me and I turn back and kiss him back, he's made a bid, I've turned toward him, literally, in response to that bid, a compliment. Um, so there are lots and lots of ways to bid, lots and lots of ways to turn towards those bids. And the more we do that, the stronger our relationships are, no matter what else is going on. Um, you can do this in the middle of an argument. Um, if you're having an argument or some kind of a conversation where things are feeling hurtful and stressful, and maybe you've misunderstood each other, or maybe someone suddenly hurt, you don't know why because you didn't actually mean to insult them, making a bid for connection then is actually a special category called a repair attempt. Even if you don't understand what's going on, even if you're still mad at the person, um, if you make a bid for connection in the middle of an argument, that's a repair attempt. Um, you might not want to make them the same way you'd make them if everything was going great, but saying something like, hey, it looks like you're upset by that, I'm sorry. Tell me more about that. That's a repair attempt. Saying, 
whoa, I just realized how that probably sounded. Let me try again. That's a repair attempt. Um, saying, do you need a minute? That must have been hard. Can I get you a cup of tea? Can I get you some Kleenex? Friendly gestures in the middle of an argument help keep the connection strong even if things are going poorly. And they make it much easier to do the negotiation and communication that will work out the problem. Um, and if you can't work out the problem, you're still going to be at a better level than if you were communicating aggressively or not at all about it. Um, so a few statistics here. Husbands who are headed for divorce disregard their wives' bids for connection 82% of the time, based on Gottman's research. In stable marriages, they disregard them only 19% of the time. So nobody's accepting bids all the time, but there's a huge difference in the patterns because of that spiral up, spiral down thing. Um, when things are going poorly, they go more poorly, and when things are going better, they go better. So there's a split. The split's not quite as large among women. Um, wives headed for divorce disregard their husband's bids 50% of the time. Women are still doing more emotional labor there, even if, uh, even if things are going poorly, maybe more. Um, well, women in stable marriages disregard them only 14% of the time. So no one's responding to every bid, but the more bids you accept, the more of an emotional reservoir you have of to, to reassure you that the connection is good. If you have lots of experience built up of solid, friendly connections with this person, then when things start going wrong, you have something to lean on. If that reservoir is empty and then there's a bad communication, you don't have any trust and that connection's broken. Um, and habitually rejected bids result in loneliness absence of trust, lack of connection overall in the relationship. Happily married couples bid more often, like up to 10 times a minute over dinners that he observed. Um, it's much lower among uh, couples that are not happy and are headed for divorce. It's more like 65 average. He didn't compare averages, unfortunately, so it's not a very good comparison. Um, same thing happens in other kinds of relationships. When parents reject their kids' bids, when they turn against them or turn away, those kids grow up without that trust and being able to rely on their parents' love and support. And they end up lonely, they end up anxious, they can end up angry. Um, the more we can turn towards our kids' bids, the more we help them develop emotional intelligence. Um, and Gottman has a book that's specifically about raising emotionally intelligent children, too. Um, turning towards the bid doesn't necessarily mean you agree with what the person's saying, or like what they're doing, or anything like that, but it means you want to maintain the connection with them. And if you reassure them that you want to maintain the connection with them, then you can work on the disagreement. A lot of the time we don't bid clearly. We make kind of a fuzzy, deniable bid because we don't want to show ourselves as vulnerable. We don't want to say, hey, I really want your attention. I really care about what you think and how you treat me. And it would make me feel sad if you withdrew. That's a very vulnerable place to be in. But if we don't make our bids clear, people don't always hear them. And then we may think we've asked for attention and then not gotten it. It's better to ask. Um, you can improve your own bids in a few ways. Make them more often. Think about your timing. Sometimes you know someone is preoccupied, working on something that's time critical, anxious. Think about how that bid is going to be received in that moment. Um, you can use a soft approach. If you're feeling neglected and you want more time with your partner, don't use a harsh startup like, you don't spend time with me. That's not really going to be heard as a bid, that's going to be heard as a criticism. So something like, hey hon, I really love spending time with you, and it's been seeming like we don't have a lot of that lately. Could we maybe spend some time this weekend? That's a bid for connection and a request. It's very different from a criticism. Um,
And some other important pieces besides bids are understanding how you work and how your partner works. I'm just going to very briefly talk about some of the pieces of that and then turn this over to discussion. Um, we all have a whole bunch of separate systems in our brains. Mickey's talked some about that on the uh, uh, lizard monkey CPU level. But there are also specific systems to protect things in our brains, in, in, our, in ourselves, um, because we have needs for control, learning, this curiosity, um, pleasure, play, rest and recuperation, safety, belonging. We have all these systems and they can be in conflict. Different ones are stronger in different people. Um, and in a particular situation, one may come to the forefront in one person, one may come, a different one may come to the forefront in a different person. Understanding what you're most driven by and in what situations and what your partner is most driven by and in what situations can help you be in sync when you communicate. Um, some of Gottman's books have things like questionnaires and exercises that you can do to help you understand your own drives better. There's also a lot about emotional heritage. How you were raised, especially, but also your past relationship experiences um, have primed you to have certain expectations about how relationships work um, and how you are supposed to bid. Your family will have taught you messages about how emotions are to be handled. Is it okay to, to be angry? Is it okay to show anger? Is it okay to be sad? Or is that unmanly? Is it okay to say I love you? Or does that just put you in too vulnerable a place that you shouldn't dare? Um, there are different emotions that people will be afraid of or comfortable with showing and comfortable with showing in different ways. Knowing those things about yourself and about your partner um, is really helpful as well. So there's a whole lot about understanding yourself and understanding your partner. And he describes that as, as learning your love map and learning your partner's love map. Again, there are questionnaires in a bunch of his books that you can do to understand more about each other. Know your partner's dreams, fears, habits, what they're thinking about lately. Um, the more you understand your own landscape and your partner's landscape, and the more you can recognize your own and your partner's emotional state, the easier it is to communicate about things and to exist harmoniously. Um, and the, the final thing that he talks about in Improving Marriages is find and create shared meaning. Um, find ways in which you can support and develop your partner's dreams, rituals that you have together as a family or as a couple. Um, I mean, even in jokes that I mentioned are shared meaning, small scale, but you know, this, is, this is part of who we are. Um, problem solving together, working together towards goals. So there's lots that you can do to improve a relationship, even from one side, but both partners working together on it is way better. Um, and the core part of it is make bids and turn towards your partner's bids. <laughs>